Aung San Suu Kyi, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. I see you in these amazing public events now, accepting finally the Congressional Gold Medal, the Nobel Peace Prize. You get a hero's welcome. You look visibly pained when people are standing up in these prolonged standing O's. Is it weird for you? No, it's, uh, I appreciate it very much, but sometimes I feel a little embarrassed. Why embarrassed? It doesn't seem right for anybody to get so much uh, attention. And, and yet what you've done has been so dramatic. What do you think is your greatest achievement? If you had to sum it up, what would you say has brought you these Congressional Gold Medals, the Nobel Prize? I don't think uh, it's yet time to say what my greatest achievement is. I think I have received these prizes for the efforts I've made to reach the goal that all my countrymen and women would like to reach. There's still some way to go. Obviously, it's a dramatically different situation. A few years ago, there's no way you would have been able to sit here. Do you call now for the end of sanctions against Burma, Myanmar? Do you think the export sanction particularly should be lifted now? You mean the imports into the United States? Exactly, export yes. from, from yeah, Burma. That's right. Well, I think it should be lifted now. I th uh, it can't really be lifted yet, but there can be a waiver. And I would very much support such a move because I think I, it's time we gave our people a chance to show what they can do. And I've said before that we can't depend on external su support forever to achieve our own ends. We'll always, we'll always appreciate what our friends do and I hope that they will continue to do whatever is necessary. But we must, must also take responsibility for our own destiny. So it's time to let the minerals and the gas and all the riches be able to be imported into this country? Yes, provided there's transparency and accountability. What about political prisoners? The president announced an amnesty a short while ago. Are you satisfied that this includes the political prisoners, enough of the kind of people you need to see released? No, not all the people on our list have been uh, released and there are other lists which are, I think, which are probably a little more, a little longer than ours. So I think there are still others waiting to be released. Do you believe it will happen? I think so. I think it should happen as soon as possible. And are you on the same wavelength with the president and the government on this issue? I don't know what, what it means to be on the same wavelength with, with, with them, but I think uh, there are many people in the government who agree that political prisoners should be released. You're now working with a former general. Ten Sen is now the president of your country. These are the people who prevented you from seeing your husband, who kept your children separated from you, not to mention the oppression in your country itself. Tell me what it is like to now have to be a politician and work with this group of people. I've never thought that what they did to me was personal anyway. It is politics. And if you decide to go into politics, you have to be prepared uh, to put up with, this kind of, with these kind of problems. I, I, I like a lot of the generals. I'm rather inclined to liking people. That would sound pretty dramatic for people to hear, that you like the generals. Well, I've always got on with people in the army. You mustn't forget that my father was the founder of the Burmese army, and this is why I have a soft spot for them. Even though I don't like what they do, that's different from not liking them. I'm stunned. Are you really? Yes, I'm stunned. I, I think it's perfectly natural for me to feel this way. Do you believe that your relationship with the president is crucial not just your personal relationship, but your political relationship is crucial to enable a full and proper transition from military dictatorship to a full democracy. I think it's always uh, a little dangerous to make this kind of work a personal uh, occupation. I think we should look at it more f from a from an objective point of view. I think it is important that the executive, the legislature, and well, the, judu judu the judiciary that we're trying to develop work together to strengthen democratic institutions and practices. And yet, I know you don't want to take this sort of personal um, 
I suppose, not responsibility, but it don't, you don't want to frame it so much in the personal. But the truth of the matter is, it is about you. You are the person that made this happen. It might not have happened without somebody like well, you. I don't think so. I think without many, many others, it would not have happened. The people of my country and uh, the people of the United States who have supported us, the United States administrations. I've got to really say thank you to the U.S. Congress while I'm about it because they've been so supportive over the years and others around the world. So I don't, in a sense, I think one must take responsibility for one's actions and one's decisions, but one should never take uh, uh, one should never assume that everything that happens for the good is achieved by oneself alone. Obviously, during house arrest, I assume in order to survive and get through it, you had to be pretty stubborn, you had to be pretty uncompromising about what you were doing and what you were struggling for. Now, you've spoken about how you need to compromise. Describe that transition. But there's never been a transition. I was never given a chance to compromise. You cannot compromise unless people talk to you. Since there was never any kind of dialogue, never any kind of uh, consultation uh, with, with, with us, with the Forces for Democracy, we were never given a chance to compromise. People keep saying, uh, I've changed. I used to be confrontational. But I'm not, I haven't changed. It was, it's just that circumstances have changed. Of course, I've matured. I hope so. I mean, one shouldn't mature over 20 years. But you did, you did say we're beginning to learn the art of compromise, give and take, the achievement of consensus. Ah, this is in the legislature. I was talking about the legislature. And uh, having been there just a couple of months, I have to say I'm very encouraged uh, by the way things are proceeding. We have a speaker who is very fair-minded and who treats us as a proper opposition in spite of our very, very small numbers. Do you remember what it was like that time when you faced the soldiers and their rifles pointed at you and you walked straight towards them? Ah, oh, that was a long time back. Do you remember it? Yes, of course. What went through your mind? People held back, but you didn't. You walked straight towards them. Well, I wasn't given much choice because, uh, first of all, they said, to, you know, you, you must all move to the side of the street. So I said, fine. So we, I said, let's walk on the side of the street. And then he said something like uh, that he would shoot whether or not we were on the side of the street or on the street itself. And I decided I might as well be on the street. The fact that they didn't, what did that tell you? Well, um, a major came running up. He, uh, he had been walking behind us and he came running up and, and stopped. Uh, the man who was in charge, who I think was a captain. And then there was another major attempt on your life in 2003. Many, many people were killed. How did you keep going after that? Well, how could I not keep going after that? One has to keep going, especially because of incidents like that. You talk about the sanctions. There seems to be something of a debate about how actually effective and instrumental the sanctions were in causing these reforms and causing the military dictatorship to, to, to pave the path towards democracy. Are you convinced that sanctions actually did it? Because obviously they still had access to all sorts of riches and they really hurt quite a lot of the common people. A lot of people lost their jobs. Of course, it was in sanctions alone that brought about the reforms, but I think sanctions played a, a very, very important part. After all, if not, why is it that uh, the, the Burmese government has been asking for the removal of sanctions? I think they were politically very effective. I do not agree that they affected the Burmese economy that much. I always quote the IMF and say that they, they have... Uh, come to the conclusion that the Burmese economy was not that much affected by the sanctions and what had created the mess in Burma was simply mismanagement. So you think politically and psychologically yes, they I were think more so. effective? I think so. In the by-election, do you think the regime was surprised that you won so many, your party won so many of the seats, practically all of the ones that were contested? I think a great many of them were. I'm sure there were some who realized that this is how it was going to turn out. And what do you expect for the next set of elections in 2015? Do you expect to become the majority? 
I think it's too early to think of 2015, and I think the next two years are the more important ones. How we develop into a working democracy, and that will decide what the 2015 elections will be like. I want to ask you a couple of personal questions because you're a very public person. I usually don't like personal questions. I know questions. you don't. But as a mother, I want to ask you about the price that it, that it took to do what you did. I think many working mothers, you know, we grapple with our absences. We grapple with how to make it up to our kids. And yours have been more dramatic and more intense than any mother I can imagine. Do you wonder how one day you can make it up to your kids? Do you feel you have? Do you feel that's a resolved relationship? I don't think of it as making up to my children, because after all, they're not children anymore. They're but grown they up. Yes, they were. And you can't make it up to them as children, because they're no longer children. And they probably wouldn't like me to treat them as children anymore. In fact, I'm sure, I, I'm sure they won't like to be treated as children anymore. So I think what I would s simply wish to do is to learn to have a good relationship with them across the distance that separates us. I read that you were estranged from your son Alexander, but you will see him? I'm not estranged from my son. I think this is uh, the kind of rumor that goes around when people don't see one another for, for many, many years. When we last talked, you warned against reckless optimism. Do you think that the optimism about Burma, Myanmar is reckless these days, or do you feel it's now on a solid path? I think on the part of some it's still reckless. I, I have to mention my favorite economist who works in Burma, Sean Tanel, and uh, he talks about a gold rush of investors. And uh, I do not want that sort of thing. This is what I mean by reckless optimism. It will not help our country. And I think it might disappoint the investors as well. So I want everybody to consider what they are doing and to weigh uh, the pros and cons and to do what is best for our country as well as for themselves. I want investors to profit. That's what investing is all about. Their, their investments must bear fruit. But that fruit should be shared between our people and the investors themselves. And what what should we call your country? I hear you call it Burma in most of your public uh, presentations. It is Myanmar. It's a matter of choice. It's Myanmar in Burmese. And uh, at some, uh, some time back, I think in the 1990s, I'm not quite sure when, uh, the State Law and Order Restoration Council, very Orwellian name. Uh, Slok. Slok, that's right. Even the sound is rather Orwellian. Uh, Slok decided that uh, Burma should henceforth be called Myanmar in English as well. But um, I think we have the right uh, to freedom of expression and we can choose to call it the name that we feel comes most naturally to us. Aung San Suu Kyi, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you.